Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Leslie presents. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to welcome this special guest, lyricist Glenn Slater. Thank you so much for making the time to do this. Oh, my pleasure. I think most stories are best from the beginning. What was life like growing up? I grew up in a town called East Brunswick, about 45 minutes outside of the city. It's a bedroom community that was sort of farmland until the 1970s when a big influx of people from Brooklyn moved there. And uh, my family was one of those Brooklynites. Because we came from New York, I, we always had a very close connection to the city. We were in the city most weekends. And for Jewish families during the 70s, that meant Broadway. So I saw a lot of shows growing up. My parents gave me piano lessons, and so there was a sort of a, a natural tendency for me to pick up the sheet music and teach myself how to play the songs from the shows I saw. So uh, I sort of grew up in a, in a musical theater environment, pretty much. Were there specific shows that you went to see that were favorites? Absolutely. This was the, the sort of early to mid-70s, so Pippin was very high on my, my list of favorites. I saw the original Chicago very shortly after it opened. I think the first show I ever went to see was the revival of Gypsy with Angela Lansbury. I was probably three or four, and I still remember it fairly vividly. But I, you know, I think that sort of that pop rock sound of the early 70s was sort of the thing that I was drawn to at the time. The cast album for company was sort of on constant play in our house, so I got a little bit of everything. This playing of the piano, has that helped you as a lyricist? Oh, absolutely. I started out as a composer, and I composed music all through college, uh, and it wasn't until I got to New York and met real composers that I realized that I needed to find something else to do if I wanted to actually be involved in the theater. But I think almost every lyricist, almost every lyricist that I can think of plays an instrument or composed music at some point. It's so important, I think, to have a, a sense of how music works in order to get the words themselves to feel musical. And just being able to sort of sit with a composer and, and say, oh, we need to change keys here, or what if we went to a different harmonic structure, or did you consider going to the third rather than to the fourth, is immensely helpful. You talked about a second ago looking at the sheet music. Were you one of these people who sat there and read the names? You read who wrote the music? That was was that important to you? Oh, absolutely. I um, you know, inherited from my parents a big collection of cast albums on vinyl, and I, I just found it fascinating. And I became aware very quickly of who was who as far as the the writers went. I was a big Sondheim fan from when I, I mean, almost as much as I can remember. Loved Frank Lesser, loved Alan J. Lerner. More drawn to the cleverer writers rather than the more earnest ones. And definitely more to the ones who were writing in the 50s and 60s rather than, you know, the Gershwins and the Cole Porters. But I, yeah, I mean, I was always highly aware of who did who and what they sounded like and what the differences were. What lyricists have influenced you the most? I, you know, the ones I think I just sort of cited mm -hmm. <laughs> were, yeah. were pretty pretty high up there. I, it's pretty impossible to be a, a lyricist right now and not have been influenced by Sondheim. He's just so all-encompassing and such a, you know, unreachable and yet wonderful role model that it's impossible not to be influenced by him. I tend to think of myself more as a comic writer, and so... You know, Frank Lesser and Alan J. Lerner certainly fit into that category, and their sense of just sort of wordplay and fun with language and breeziness is something that I've always aspired to. The earlier writers, the Hearts and the Cold Porters, I admire what they do, but it was less of an influence until I got considerably older and started trying to write specifically in that kind of a 20s or 30s style. And it's it does feel more like when I when I use them as inspiration, it's more in a pesky sense than in a sort of in my blood sense. Tell us about writing the lyrics for the Ringling Brothers at Barnum and Bailey Circus. How did that come about? Let me go back a couple of concepts before I get to that. Okay. Uh, 
When I got out of college, as I mentioned earlier, I thought I was a composer, and then I met real composers and realized I needed to to actually work on the the other side of the table if I if I wanted to be writing songs for the theater. And and so I I needed to get a day job because as a composer you can get work as a rehearsal pianist as a in a pit band. I mean there are many many things you can do. Whereas rhyming isn't really something that's on a lot of people's you know lists for job qualifications. So I got a job in advertising, working as a copywriter, doing you know commercials and print ads and that sort of thing. And I would work from you know nine in the morning until midnight every day. Get home, take a nap, and then write lyrics until four or five in the morning, pretty much every night. Desperately, desperately hoping to find something to to get me out of the job. I got very lucky. After about six years of doing this, I won the Kleban Award, which is a pretty large sort of cash prize for up and coming lyricists. And it was big enough that I was able to quit the job and just work on lyrics full time. But even with that kind of support, you still sort of feel like you need to take jobs that will pay money when you can get them. And at about that time, I was contacted by Michael Starobin, the orchestrator, who also composes music. And he had just been hired by the circus to to write music for the circus and found out that part of the job was also writing songs for the ringmaster. And since he wasn't a lyricist, he was looking for somebody and somebody had given him my name had heard some of my work at, at the BMI workshop. And he gave me a call and I grabbed onto it like a life raft because it was an actual paying job as a lyricist. And it turned out to actually be a pretty great job. They usually have three or four songs in each, each edition of the circuits and they do a new edition every year. And in addition to writing the songs, when you're hired for this job, you also write the script for the ringmaster. And so you go down to Florida where they do their their sort of spring, you know, their, their winter quarters and put their show together. And you work closely with the director who for pretty much every year I did it was Phil McKinley who recently did the Spider-Man show after Julie Taymor left. And you just sort of jump in to this sort of bizarre environment and get in up to your elbows and learn everything you can about it and, you know, write uh, an entire show. I mean, it's not the length of a Broadway show, but it's still a full show in about a month. And like working in advertising, these kinds of commercial jobs are immensely valuable for a lyricist because while you're learning your craft, you're thinking purely in terms of art and in terms of how do I write the best lyric, how do I tell the best story. But when you take on a commercial job, it becomes more about how many ideas can I churn out, how many ideas are they going to kill, how do I follow what the producer wants and still maintain quality. So it's a whole different set of skills, which are fairly crucial to have when you're working, like actually working in the theater, which you don't get when you're sitting in your room and working on the craft side. And so I did that for six or seven years. Uh, I think seven years I did the circus. Long past the point where I had to do it financially, because after a certain while, I just developed a big affection for it great people and great people, the Felds, who are the producers of the circus. And it really does start to feel like a little family. And so I, I just I just got to the point where I just enjoyed doing it. How important or do you think it is important as a lyricist or any type of songwriter in the field of stage or animated features, how important is it to network and be a part of community? It's pretty crucial. You know, it's a it's a very small puddle, the the world of musical theater. There aren't that many people who do it. And there aren't that many people who enjoy it. I mean it's it's you know, for something that was sort of the big cultural showcase in the fifties and sixties, it's become a little bit of a of a niche backwater to some degree. And so pretty much everybody who works in the theater knows each other. A lot of I can't speak for everybody. But a lot of the, for me, a lot of the decision making as far as what projects to do, you know, for me, it's not only about do I connect with this particular material or do I want to write in this particular style, but a lot of it is do I want to work with these people? I've you know, met them at a party or I've been at a retreat with them or, you know, I've seen their work in a workshop, all the different ways that you sort of 
interact with people in the theater community and you just get a sense of, oh, I think we have similar interests or I think we have similar styles or I just, even just I'd like to spend some time in a room with that person it can be a big contributing factor. And, you know, certainly in terms of finding work to do, networking is immensely important. I think also in terms of just getting a sense of what the range of what musical theater can do, I sort of have a sort of band of styles and interests that that to me seem to sort of be the boundaries of what musical theater are but there are a lot of people i meet who have a lot more complicated ideas of what it could be or simpler ideas or or ideas that are purely commercial ideas that are purely artsy and i think the more you interact with people the more you get a sense of what you can do as opposed to what you naturally tend to do interesting Recently, I did an interview with songwriter Livingston Taylor, and I asked him, are you more moved by the melody or the lyrics? And he nearly screamed at me, and he said, lyrics are everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask the same question of you. Are you more moved by the music or the words in a piece? Well, you know, it's interesting, because when I started doing this, I would have definitely screamed at you the lyrics, and I always thought that the lyrics were the most important thing, and lyrics should always come first, and the music is there to support the lyrics, and I've actually come around to an almost completely different view. Hmm. And this is maybe because I've worked so much with fairly major composers, like Alan Menken and Andrew Lloyd Webber, who are fairly brilliant, both as melodists and as you know, harmonic thinkers. But what I find is that, in theater at least, because I, I don't think it's necessarily the same thing for pop music, although I think it is to some degree. In theater, what the music provides is the emotional subtext. And because it's such a powerful medium, it provides that subtext extremely loud and clearly. Lyrics can do a number of things. They can amplify that subtext. They can lead you away from the subtext. They can provide layers of text that contrast or sharply define or provide a smoke screen or provide alternate points of view against that subtext. But the subtext is always, because of the power of music, is always so prominent. And I do think to some degree, as a lyricist, part of my job is to ride that subtext, you know, to figure out how to work with it. But because it's always going to be the loudest thing in the room, the lyrics, I think, do tend to take a little bit of a backseat. With the right piece of music, the lyrics can be almost anything, and you still get exactly what the music is trying to say. And that goes for both emotional pieces. I, I've, I've worked with a composer named Steve Weiner, who is a brilliant comic composer. And he'll write a piece of music, and you'll just hear the music, and you know exactly where the punchlines go, you know exactly where you're supposed to laugh. As a lyricist, all I can do, really, is make sure the jokes fall where the music is telling me for them to, to go and make sure that the tone of what I'm saying is not getting in the way of the comic tone of the music. When I'm working with, say, Andrew Lloyd Webber, oh my God, that th those melodies are so muscular that it almost doesn't matter what I say. I could put gibberish down, and you know, I think, I think a lot of people would say about a lot of his work that the lyrics often are gibberish, <laughs> so, <laughs> and yet they still, they still speak to people. You know, a song like Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, I think even Tim Rice would admit that the lyrics don't make a huge amount of sense. And yet you get exactly what that scene is supposed to be about purely from the power of the music. Fascinating. The composers you mentioned, is there one that you feel you have a better rapport with, a greater comfort in writing with? I think the two composers that I've had the best rapport with so far, uh, one would be Alan Minkin who seems to have a great rapport with pretty much everybody he works with. So I'm certainly not you know, alone in that regard. He's an immensely flexible and immensely generous collaborator in terms of just providing the material for you to, to work with. And we have a fairly similar sense of what we're trying to do. Alan, when he picks a project, uh, generally picks it by what is the style of music going to be. And he likes working in lots of different styles, and so he may be attracted, oh, this, for this one I get to write Latin music, for that one I get to write Greek music. And for him, just the idea of diving into that musical pool is the, the exciting part. Um, I listen to a, a lot of music and a lot of different kinds of music, and I, I think we both have a fairly encyclopedic sense of what pop music is. And so 
for us, there's sort of a, this unspoken language when we're working on a project like, say, Sister Act, and we're playing in the pool of 70s soul and disco. We just sort of share a, a vocabulary and a sense of what's possible, and we can just go off and running down various obscure by roads, all the while staying within that pesky area, but sort of getting excited about about what we can do with that form. And so there's, a, I, I think, a, a lot of commonality there. The other composer that I click with quite well is the aforementioned Steve Weiner, who is not as famous as Alan Macon, sadly, but is a pretty, pretty fantastic composer. And he's somebody I started working with when I was still quite young. I met him at the BMI workshop. And we clicked simply because we have very similar senses of humor. And the same things make us laugh, and the same sort of quirks are the things that sort of attract us to a, to a funny idea. And there's just something about knowing that we're laughing at the same things that makes the ideas flow faster and easier. Ah. I think we talked earlier about how lyricists are usually also composers, and I think the other, the opposite tends to be true as well. I think the best composers are the ones who have also written lyrics because they have a sense of how to put together the architecture of a song. They have a sense of what characters need to sound like. They have a sense of what's singable. And both of these composers also started out as lyricists. And so there's a very easy flow of ideas. You know, there's no sharp distinction between lyrics and music. Although with both, I'm very clearly the lyricist and they're very clearly the composer. Often they will suggest song titles or jokes or lines. And often I will suggest melodies and chords to go to and structures. So there's a, a lot of easy give and take, which I think that kind of flexibility is fairly key to working quickly and to making the idea as strong as possible. I wanted to ask you about Stephen Weiner just a moment. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there's a bit of a comedic commonality there. Mm -hmm. What would a typical session be like? Do you dive right into the work or is there a little bit of banter first? Well, it's, it's different with everybody. I think when it works best, there's a lot of banter first. It's a lot of talking about the characters and what the characters want and what the characters would do and wouldn't do. It's a lot of talking about the idea for the song, and particularly for a comedy song. It's so crucial that the idea itself is funny rather than just, now I'm going to go write some funny lyrics. If the idea itself isn't already funny just when you say the idea, then all the funny lyrics in the world will get you to clever, but they won't get you to flee. And because the composer is providing the subtext for whatever this is, whatever that moment is, it needs to be talked in a lot of detail. And so with both Minkin and Steve Weiner, I will talk at immense length. With Alan, it's usually, uh, we get about a good hour or so of, of just sitting and talking before he can't keep his hands off the piano. But the talking goes on well after he's started writing music. And, you know, what he will do is he'll just start playing melodies. And I will say, well, that's close. That's not close. I like this. Can we work with that? And as, we, as he's sort of playing melodies, we're continuing to talk about what the character would do or what the situation requires or what the big theme of the show is and how it's going to be reflected in this one moment or in terms of like pop music, whether or not we're on the right track for the for getting the the sound right in order to capture that historical moment or that cultural moment. With Steve Weiner, what he will do is we will talk on the phone quite a bit, hours, and then he will go off and just start producing musical themes. And we'll sit back down a week later and he'll say, well, here's what I think the main theme is, and we'll just start playing. And I'll say, here's another, here's another variation, here's a, a different one, and he'll just sort of trot out maybe seven, eight, nine different bits of music, which are all generally closely related to each other, and then we'll sit down together and start tinkering and saying, well, I can see this going to that, I see this connecting to that. And all the while, again, as we're talking about the music, everything else is in play as well, so it's a, it's sort of a a musical, historical, narr narrative, character, just sort of melange of conversation that's constantly going. How did you come to meet Alan Menken? 
Okay. So shortly after I left advertising, and this would have been in 1996, I had been working on a show with Steve Weiner based on the movie Lost in America, the Albert Brooks movie. And we had done a workshop of it at the ASCAP workshop. And somebody from Disney had come to that ASCAP workshop and approached us afterwards and said, oh, we're looking for people to take part in a sort of a program we're developing where we're looking for young writers and young songwriters and sort of matching them up on projects that may not ever get made, but they give us a sense of how they write and how they are to work with. And they gave us a script written by a a writer who at that time was completely unknown named Joss Whedon, who went on to write Buffy the Vampire Slayer and half of the Marvel movies and is obviously a big deal. And the script he wrote, which was about Marco Polo, was just brilliant and funny and perfectly structured. And we just jumped on it and wrote five or six songs in a couple of months, which turned out extremely well. And the Disney people were very pleased and very excited, and they said, this is wonderful. This was maybe six months before Mulan was about to be released. And they said, you know, there's, we're never going to make this movie because we're not going to make two Chinese movies anytime close to each other. But, you know, thank you so much for working on this, and we'll be in touch. And then several months went by, and nobody was in touch. And I started getting very antsy that this great opportunity was going to disappear. And so I did a little bit of research, and I found out who Alan Menken's agent was. And I called him up and I said, you've never heard of me. I've never been produced, but I just did this thing for Disney and they seem to like the work very much. And I feel like I've gotten a foot in the door, but I'd love to get more than a foot in the door. And you seem to have an an entire leg, if not most of your torso. Um, (laughs) You know, do you think there's anything that you could do to help if I, if I came on board as a client? And he said, well, send over the material. Let me take a listen. And he called me back an hour later and said, I'd love to represent you and your partner. Let's do it. And very exciting when you get an agent and then, you know, again, several months went by and nothing happened. And then the phone rang and he said, okay, I've got some good news and bad news. The good news is that Alan Macon is working on a project for Disney and the lyricist is not working out. And I mentioned your name and Disney got very excited about that. And I played your work for Alan and he thinks your style is very similar to Howard Ashman's and he'd love to meet with you. The bad news is you're going to have to find a way to tell Steve Weiner that you're getting this call and he's not. Ooh. And it's, that's always a rough thing to have to do. But I went up to meet with Alan, and there's always this sort of moment of trepidation when you're a completely unknown writer and you're meeting with somebody who is as – and he was already massively iconic and had already done you know, most of the, the Disney material that he's famous for. And so I went up to his palatial estate up in Upper Westchester and – I was beckoned into his studio, which is this huge state-of-the-art room, and I was sat down in front of the wall of trophies, and it it really is an entire wall. It's, you know, eight Oscars and 12 Grammys. I don't even know what he has, but it's literally a wall full of trophies, incredibly intimidating. And he had asked me before I came up to just try to throw together a lyric for a, a moment in this project, which was... It was a sequel to the Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And the idea was that it was not It was more of a prequel than a sequel. So it was the story of how Roger got to Hollywood in the first place. And the style was meant to be in sort of like the RKO musicals of the 30s, like the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers musicals. So a very gershwin sort of musical world. I took my best shot at doing an Ira Gershwin-style lyric, and I put it in front of Alan Menken, and I sat down in front of that wall of trophies and he started to play and it was like oh my god I just wrote an Alan Macon song because he's so fast it just came right off of his fingers and it sounded fantastic and he finished he played through the whole lyric and looked up and said well I think this is going to work and that was it I was we were off and running wow that project never never got off the ground it ended up being too expensive but before they put the kibbutz on it they had already asked us if we would do what would become Home on the Range, and that project didn't work out very well. But before that one was done, they had asked us to start on the Little Mermaid stage show. So one thing sort of followed the other, and you know we just we just clicked right from the beginning. What do you think about the work of the late Howard Ashman? Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, he was sort of a genius, so it's hard not to to be both immensely impressed and slightly intimidated. It's a little bit of a sore spot for me because 
I've been working in his shadow for 15 years, and it's a pretty big shadow to get out from under. You know, Howard was fairly unique in that he wasn't just a lyricist, and he, he was also able to write music, but he was also a director, and he was a producer. So he kind of had his hands in, in every aspect of the theater and had a sort of a, a mastery of it. And it served him extremely well when he got to Disney because he was able to sort of take charge. At the time when he got there, Disney was their animation department was sort of falling apart. They hadn't had a hit in years and years. And everybody running it was still fairly young and green. And he was able to walk in and say, okay, this is how you do a musical. And he had a receptive audience there, and they kind of turned the reins over to him and let him run with it. And because he was so good at so many different things, he was able to really sort of pull everything together and and create kind of, I mean, almost like a new art form because the animated musical hadn't, really been anything like what he ended up doing with, which is incredibly impressive and something that nobody has really been able to do since because nobody's come into that role with that range of talents and that opportunity. It's very hard to do what he did when you're not Howard Ashman, when you're not, when you don't have the presence and the charisma of a director and the experience of a producer and a sort of, you know, a power structure that's willing to put those reins in your hands and let you run. It's been interesting trying to live up to his legend and, you know, finding it both incredibly inspiring and kind of frustrating. Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about Tangled? What was your favorite memory from working on that project? Well, Tangled, you know, originally they had brought Stephen Schwartz in to do the lyrics for Tangled. Actually, let me back up even before that. Tangled had been in production at Disney for years and years and years. I think a Rapunzel movie was one of the things that Walt originally wanted to do back in the 30s and never really figured out a way to crack the story. And the version that it ended up being, I think had been in various states of production for at least 10 years before it ended up becoming what what it became. When John Lasseter took over the entire animation side of Disney, that was one of the things that was sort of floundering. And he put a young team on it who had just done the movie Bolt. It was two directors and a writer. Dan Fogelman is the writer. Nathan Greno and Byron, I want to say Byron Howard, although I think that I'm getting his last name wrong. And they sort of went off on a retreat, and they cracked out a story in about a month. And Lasseter said, that's great. It's great they came up with the story so fast, and I really love this. But in order to, to not get bogged down in costs, we have to turn this movie around really quickly. And essentially gave them a year to put the entire thing together. So they very quickly came to, to Alan because of his experience. They knew that he'd be able to do it quickly, and they brought on Stephen. And Stephen looked at the material and said, well, I think this needs to be set in Russia. I think this is crying out for a sort of Russian treatment. And they didn't want to set it in Russia. They had set it in their sort of French-German grim territory. And after two meetings where they couldn't sort of come to an agreement on that, Stephen left, and they very hurriedly rushed me in. And I was told on the plane as I was flying out, they have a very clear idea of what they want to do. Your job is not to come up with new ideas of what they want to do. It's just to execute the ideas that they already have. And we were under pretty severe time constraints. So... An incredibly exciting opportunity, but one that already I had my hands tied a little bit. While we were on the plane heading out to the first meeting, Alan said to me, what what style do you think we should be doing this in? And I said to him, well, you know, it's this young teenage girl, and she's kind of barefoot, and she's got the long hair. And they sent us this image of her you know, sitting in her tower, strumming a guitar. I said, I'm getting a very, like, Joni Mitchell folk rock vibe. And he looked at me and said, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. And so that was the the first pitch we made to them was, can we we try to work it in this style, which they got very excited about because there hadn't yet been a Disney film in that style, and they wanted to do something new. And so it it was just all very intense. We were just thrown in quickly, and, you know, the script would change on a, on a weekly basis, and half of what we were working on got thrown out. The whole folk rock thing sort of got lost in translation. But I think the, the best memory, mm-hmm. we were working on what ended up being the, the big ballad moment in the movie. And they had all these drawings they had made of, of Rapunzel and Flynn in their boat with the lanterns going up all around them. And it looked like it was going to be a stunningly beautiful animation sequence. We wrote a song that was sort of a big, soaring, muscular ballad. 
And we played it for them and for the directors. And they said, well, it's beautiful. We like it. And there was that implied but. And he said, okay, but, go ahead. He said, well, it just feels like every other Disney ballad there's ever been. It just feels so big and Broadway. And is there any way we can make this a different kind of a moment? And so we sat in the room and we talked quite a bit. And what we, what we decided was that these are two characters who were talking at each other in sort of screwball patter for most of the movie. The moment when they finally realize that they love each other should almost be a, the opposite of what their entire interaction was. Instead of being a big verbal moment, we said, what if it's a smaller moment, a simpler moment, a moment where sort of everything gets stripped away? And that called for a much smaller piece of music, smaller and a more gentle and a more self-contained piece of music. And so Alan started, said, you know, sat down at the piano, and he said, well, how about this? And he whipped out a melody that I listened to, and he said, oh, my God, that's going to be a hit song. And he said, well, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. And I said, well, how about this? And he whipped out another melody. And again, he heard it, and he said, that's going to be enormous. And no, that's a little too renaissance Is there something else? We sat there for, I think, five or six hours with Alan just ripping out melody after melody, any one of which could have been a fantastic song. As they got torn down, I, I mean, it was like, you know, having a piece of your heart ripped away. It was like, oh my God, I wish I could have written that one. I wish I could have written that one. And then finally he came up with a, a piece of music that was just very simple and very short and very sweet. And as soon as they heard it, they said, that's the one. That's the one. It doesn't sound like anything we've done before. It feels like, that feels like a girl in, her, in a room with a guitar. That gets at that sort of the sense of simplicity we want. And because of the deadlines, I basically had a, I mean, it was now six o'clock at night, we'd been there all day. And I, I got the music down on tape, ran off to my hotel room, sat up all night. I came in with what ended up being, I see the light. And, you know, I mean, I had basically 10 hours to work on it. And I said, well, this isn't the right title. And, you know, I just repeated the chorus twice. So I'm gonna have to change that. And Alan sat down and said, okay, let's just see what it is. And he played it, and everybody in the room said, oh, my God, that's it. Stop. Don't do another thing. Don't change a word. I said, but, 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 <laughs> these aren't the final words. This is just a draft. Nope. They said, this is it. I'm not changing a thing. And that's how it ended up in the movie. But just that sense of, of everybody in the room just sort of reaching for the same thing and knowing exactly when we had found it, and just that sense of urgency and excitement, I don't think I've ever had an experience quite like that before. When we ended up putting that music to the visuals, it was just everybody just sort of said, wow, we nailed that. So, great moment. What do you find Andrew Lloyd Webber like to work with? Well, Andrew is, works in a, a completely different way. You know, I think of Alan as a pop writer who knows a lot about theater. I think Andrew is an opera writer who knows a lot about pop. And... As befitting an opera composer, he's much more focused on the music than he is on almost any other aspect. Like opera composers, the plot and the characterization and the actual words don't concern him so much as the big sweep of feelings and the big emotions and the big plot turns. And it's just a very different way of working. When we did Love Never Dies, he had got a synopsis of a story from a writer named Ben Elton, who he had done The Beautiful Game with. And the, the merits or demerits of that story aside, whatever it was in that document really spoke to Andrew. And he just sat down and said, okay, I see what the big emotions are here, and he just started writing music. When I got the call from him, he had already written about an hour and a half of music. And had gone to Abbey Road with a 90-piece orchestra and recorded that music. And so he basically said to me, well, here's the music that feels right to me, and here's the synopsis, and here's how each piece of music fits into the synopsis. Now just go and do the words, <laughs> basically. So, so a very different, not a lot of discussion about character or plot or tone. It was more of a here's one side of the sandwich and here's the other side of the sandwich, put them together. And then once I got into it, then there was a lot of discussion of, all right, this character isn't working and this scene isn't working and I'm not sure what, how this music fits here. There were things that had to be added. So, for example, in the synopsis, we have Raul and the Phantom being rivals for the hand of Christine. But 
there was no scene written in which Raul and the Phantom were ever in a, in a room together or singing together. And so we had to figure out where to put that scene and how to construct it. And those moments where I was sort of filling in the big sweeping, uh, filling in you know the smaller sort of glue for the big sweeping moments were when I actually got a real sense of writing with him. And so unlike Alan, who will sit down and you'll start talking and help you playing as you talk, Andrew is much more private in his composing. I find that he listens, he takes it in, and then he needs to go off somewhere by himself and noodle around with the sound. So when he's got something, he'll come to you with it and say, this is it, I found it. Often, musically, it's what he comes to you with is much simpler than what Alan will come to you with in terms of just like the, the way it sounds played on the piano. But I think that's because Alan is hearing it as a piano piece, whereas Andrew is hearing it for a full orchestra. And as simple as it may sound as he sits down at a piano and plunks it out, he's got every bit of the orchestration already worked out in his mind. And so some of it, I just as a, as a lyricist, you just have to sort of take on faith. Okay, he knows where this is going, and I'm going to just sort of start putting down some markers, some words that will get to where I think the song is going, and if I'm on the right track, he'll let me know. So it's a little bit more sort of testing things out and seeing if the visions are jibing. It's and a little bit less of that, you know, sort of instant matching of sensibilities. Sometimes when I have asked lyricists this, they have recited the line and sometimes they've sung it. But I like to ask, is there a favorite line that you have ever written you're particularly proud of? I don't know if there is. That's a pretty fraught idea for me because I'm one of those writers who isn't really proud of anything he's done. Almost everything I've ever written, I think, could have been done better. And it's very hard for me after I've written it and it's been recorded and it's been and it's finished for me to actually go back and listen to anything. I almost never go to the theater to see a show of mine once it's opened. I've never listened to any of the cast albums of any of the shows I've done. I just sort of keep moving forward because it's when I listen to the work I've done, all I hear is the things that didn't work, the opportunities that I missed, the rewrites that got rejected by the director or that the actor felt weren't what they wanted to do. Or all, the, all, all, all I see are the warts and the flaws. I can say that I was very proud of the chorus of the song Leap of Faith for that show that ended up not working at all. You know, we needed a, a song to sort of cap this show that was very cynical about religion. The chorus ends with the line, step into the sky, which is not anything wonderful as far as the lyric goes, but for that particular moment in the music and for that particular moment in the, in the story, there's something about that sense of stepping into emptiness that just felt simple and right and... Every time I hear it, it gives me a little bit of that sort of catching your breath when things just come together the right way. And then I've written an entire show with Steve Weiner based on the, the movie The Hutsucker Proxy, which quite the opposite. That line is maybe my favorite simple idea. The Hutsucker Proxy is just is by far the cleverest lyrics I've ever written and the funniest lyrics I've ever written. Almost every every line is has something fun and bizarre and twisted and dense about it and unfortunately there are some rights issues and so that show has never seen the light of day but every time I go back and listen to it I say damn I'm the best work I've ever done huh. nobody's ever heard it nobody's ever heard it you said you like to look forward so what are you most excited about in the future I've got a bunch of projects that are sort of in mid-flight right now one of which is a TV series for ABC called Gallivant it's a something sort of new under the sun. It's a it's a half hour musical comedy set in a medieval fairy tale world, sort of like a cross between The Princess Bride and Monty Python. So both deeply silly and with a sort of emotional core that still makes everything matter and has stakes. And we're working with the same writer who did Tangled, uh, Dan Fogelman, and we're we're actually just sort of in the middle of it right now, getting working furiously to get it all done for a, a January air. Date, but it's uh, so much fun and something about the just again the urgency of having to get things done for television where, where the deadlines are so, so short is just very freeing and liberating and exciting I'm working on a, a stage show with Alan based on the one man show A Bronx Tale uh, and this is with Chaz Palmentieri who created that work writing the book 
you know, this is set in the Bronx in the 1960s, and so the feel is very, it's sort of a doo-wop R&B score, which also has a little bit of like a street opera aspect to it. And again, just something very fun about taking a pop style and diving deep into that pop style and finding ways to make it work theatrically. So much fun. I'm about to get started on a project with Andrew Lloyd Webber, which is based on the film School of Rock. You know, it's funny because uh, I mention it and a lot of people think, Andrew Lloyd Webber, School of Rock, that doesn't really compute. And even Andrew is wondering a little bit whether he's the right person for it. But I have to say, having heard a lot of the material that he's done that's sort of rock-based, he's absolutely the right person for it. And it's so exciting to hear what's coming out of him for this piece, which is so very different than anything he's done before. And funny, which he hasn't really done before. Even with, with Tim Rice, his work has been clever sometimes, but never flat out funny. And I think this is, that's where this, this one is going. And then I'm working on a project with my wife, who's a composer as well, called Beatsville. And this is a set in the Beatnik era, 1950s Greenwich Village. And my wife is a, a very talented jazz performer as well as a composer. This was her opportunity to sort of dive into bebop and post-bop and jazz vocalese. And I'm not doing the lyrics for that. I'm just doing the book. So she's both composing and lyrics. But tremendously fun. She's a, a fantastic lyricist. So it's, it's a relief a little bit for me to let go of, of those reins and hand them over to her and let her worry about all the rhyming. And just so much fun working with my wife, who's, you know, it's, it's, we get to sort of work and play. So it's, it's a lot of fun. What is the best thing about being Glenn Slater? Uh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to have to talk to my therapist about that one, I think. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. The best thing about being Glenn Slater, I'm not that tall. So it's certainly not the height part. And I used to be better looking than I am now, so it's not that. I think that I've been very lucky and I've had lots of opportunities and I get the chance to sort of flex lots of different muscles. I get to write in pop styles and I get to write in bigger, more emotional styles and I get to work with a lot of sort of very well-known and talented people and I get to work on high-profile projects. So honestly, maybe just the luckiness is the best part of being me because I've been so very lucky. What do you want to say to anyone listening to this interview? I guess what I would want to say, in the best musical theater writing, there's a sort of effortlessness which makes it work, a sense of spontaneity, a sense that the characters are coming up with words out of thin air as they're prancing across the stage. And I think that's one of the hallmarks of the best musical theater is that sense of, of freshness and effortlessness. But to get to that effortlessness takes an enormous amount of effort. And as somebody sitting in the in the audience, I don't think any anybody really has a sense of how much effort it, it actually takes. Not just the, the effort with the rhyming dictionary and the pad and pencil, and not just the effort of being in the room with the composer, because those are actually the best parts. I think for me, the happiest moments of working in the theater are those moments where I'm sitting with the composer in front of the piano and I've given them a final lyric for the first time and we sing through it, just the two of us, and, and say, look, we made a song. But after that moment, after that moment where you've created something comes the moment where you give it to a singer, many of whom are brilliant, but definitely have their own spin on what it's what it is and what it does and how they want to sing it, and to a director who has his own ideas, and to scenic designers and lighting designers and producers, and it gets away from you a little bit. And all the while you're fighting for your original vision and trying to make it match with the vision of the people that you're working with, because you know it's not it's not like you're in opposition to all these people who want to get their fingerprints on the work. It's you're all working together. You want them to have their fingerprints on the work, but it's effortful. It's you know it takes it takes a lot of work. And then you get into the rehearsal room and there you bring in another aspect, which is the audience. And some things work for the audience and some things don't work for the audience. And there are more fixes to do. And then there's another aspect, which is time, because you have deadlines and shows have to get on and movies have to go in the can. And so all along this route, there's compromise after compromise after compromise. And as an audience member sitting there in front of the final piece, what you're seeing is the result of so much work and so much compromise. And... I guess what I would say is be critical, demand the best work you can get, have opinions, but also be aware that everybody whose work is up there on the stage or up there on the screen bled and sweated over that work and would possibly be just as critical as you are 
nobody's trying to do anything but the best work they can, and sometimes they get it, and sometimes they don't, and just sort of, I guess, respect the amount of work and the amount of, I guess, the blood and sweat and tears that go into it. My last question, I must confess, is another tough question. Okay. My last question, who is Glenn Slater? Oh, that's certainly a very tough one. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm not sure how anybody else would answer this. I think there are different kinds of writers. There are creative writers who come up with ideas and have urgent things they want to say and messages they want to get across and areas of interest that are of vital importance to them. And then there are reactive writers who you put some raw material into their hands and they like to get their hands dirty playing with that material. I don't think one is privileged above the other. I mean, Shakespeare was a reactive writer. Most opera composers are reactive writers. I think I fall into that category of reactive writer. It's hard for me to say who I am because unlike writers who are more, you know, working with their own personal material, what I like to do is to get my hands on other material and play with it. I guess what I, where I would come out here, boy, this is a really hard question, is I, I'm, what makes me tick as a writer and what gets me excited is how do I make this work? How do I solve this problem? How do I get all the pieces to come together? How do I, how do I crack the code? And I'm a problem solver. I am a piece putter together. I am a how do we make this work guy. It's a little less flashy than the people who are having ideas burst out of their heads, but it's fairly crucial for the people I work with because I get them out of the tight corners. And there's something I find immensely satisfying about that role. I'm the quiet guy who sits in the back of the orchestra. I don't really interact with the actors that much. I don't interact with the crew that much. I'm the person who, when things aren't going right, everybody turns to. Mr. Slater, thank you very much. Thank you for this interview. Thank you. I, I appreciate the immense honesty and the thought. I could tell you put so much thought into the answers, and I don't always get that from my guests. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. It's a lot of thoughtful questions and definitely some ones near the end that I, I had no idea how to answer, and I hope, that, I hope that people can make sense of them. As I said, I've been very lucky, and I've gotten so many opportunities to work on so many interesting projects with so many interesting people. So I'm, I'm just grateful to be able to, to talk about it. Have a great day, and again, thank you very much. Thank you.